Assalamu alaikum friends, welcome back to another episode of Bacteriology series. Today we'll be looking at Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But before getting into the video, I'd like to say thank you to TrueLearn for sponsoring this video. TrueLearn is an online platform that provides quizzes and practice tests for medical students, nurses and others. If you are interested, I've got you a special discount code that you can use at the checkout. You can sign up on TrueLearn by clicking on the link in the description or the one showing on the screen. Sign up and enjoy. Let's get started with today's video. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a single bacterium and it belongs to a group of bacteria and that group is termed as pseudomonads. Pseudomonads are gram-negative rods that resemble the members of Enterobacteriaceae but different in that they are strict aerobes because they derive their energy only by oxidation of sugars, not by fermentation. Because they do not ferment glucose, that's why they are termed as not fermenters in contrast to the members of Enterobacteriaceae, which do ferment glucose. Oxidation involves electron transport by cytochrome C, which means they are oxidase positive. And Pseudomonas aeruginosa belongs to the Pseudomonadaceae family. This is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa under microscope. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is able to grow in water that contains only the traces of nutrients um, in waters like tap water, which favors its persistence in the hospital environment. Pseudomonas aeruginosa has a remarkable ability to withstand disinfectants, which means it is resistant to disinfectants and because of that, it's the cause of many hospital liquid infections. Pseudomonas aeruginosa has been found growing in hexachlorophene containing soap solutions, in antiseptics, and in detergents. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a motile bacterium because it has got the flagella. In this picture, you can see the Pseudomonas aeruginosa having this flagella. By the way, it's the multi-drug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. As I mentioned earlier that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is resistant to disinfectants, because of that it is involved in many hospital acquired infections, like the ventilator-associated pneumonia. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can also cause sepsis, upper respiratory tract infections, and pneumonia in patients with lowered host defenses. It also causes chronic lower respiratory tract infections, mentioned here as LRT, in patients with cystic fibrosis, wound infections, and in burn patients. It also causes malignant otitis externa in diabetic patients. It is also involved in skin infections and endocarditis. I was wondering if you're looking for a comprehensive and user-friendly resource to boost your knowledge by practicing and not just by listening and watching these video lectures. Then TrueLearn is an excellent platform to consider. It offers thousands of practice questions with detailed explanations for USMLE, COMLEX and NCLEX preparations. You can also check your performance on their platform. The best part is you can create your own test. You can give it a name, a number, you can select the time limit and select if you want a tutor or not. And there you go, test is ready. And a very cool thing about TrueLearn is that Picmonic is also integrated in it. So if you're interested, I've got you a special discount code that you can use at the checkout. So click on the link in the description or type the link showing on the screen in your browser, sign up and enjoy. But before talking about Pseudomonas aeruginosa in much detail, we should know about bacterial classification. Bacteria are further classified into spirochetes. They are also classified into acid-fast bacteria based on acid-fast staining. And there's an exception that's the Mycoplasma bacterium. On the basis of gram staining, bacteria are further classified into gram positive. We are done with all of them. If you guys are interested, be sure to check out the channel. And into gram negative. Let's talk about gram negative bacteria. They are further subdivided into cocci like Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhoeae, and Neisseria meningitidis, and rods which are further subdivided into aerobic, for example, Pseudomonas, the topic of today's video 
into anaerobic, for example, bacteroides, and facultative, which are further subclassified into curved, for example, Campylobacter, Helicobacter, and Vibrio, and also into straight, which are further subclassified into enteric and related, for example, E. coli, Enterobacter, Serratia, Klebsiella, Salmonella, Shigella, and Proteus, into zoonotic, for example, Brucella, Francisella, Pasteurella, and Yersinia, and into respiratory, which include Haemophilus, Bordetella, and Legionella. Gram-negative bacteria are also classified based on different shapes, into Diplococci, Cocobacilli, rods, and comma-shaped. Let's talk about them in a little detail. Diplococci are further classified based on maltose fermentation. If a bacteria ferments maltose, it's Neisseria meningitidis, and if it doesn't, it's Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Cocobacilli include Haemophilus influenza, Brucella, Pasteurella, Bordetella pertussis. Rods are further subdivided based on lactose fermentation. If bacteria ferment lactose, they are going to be fast or slow fermenters. Fast ones include Klebsiella, E. coli, and Enterobacter, and slow ones include Serratia and others. And if bacteria do not ferment lactose, they are further subdivided based on oxidase test. If a bacterium comes to be oxidase positive, that's Pseudomonas. And if bacteria are oxidase negative, they are Shigella, Salmonella, Proteus, and Yersinia. The comma-shaped bacteria are further subdivided based on certain criteria, like if a bacterium produces urease, it's going to be H. pylori, if it grows in alkaline media, it's Fibrio cholerae, and if it grows in 42 degrees Celsius temperature, it's Campylobacter jejuni. I've got videos on some of these bacteria. If you guys are interested, be sure to check out the channel. Lecture outline. We're done with the introduction of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We had a look at TrueLearn. We had a look at the classification of bacteria. Now we'll be looking at the morphology of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, its habitat, transmission, pathogenesis, clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Morphology. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a gram-negative rod, so it will be rod-shaped bacterium, as you can see in this microscopic picture. It varies in size from 0.5 to 0.8 micrometers by 1.5 to 3 micrometers. It's pink-colored. The reason is it's gram-negative. Structure. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an encapsulated bacterium. It's non-spore-forming bacterium. It's a motile bacterium because it has got the flagella that I showed you earlier in this video. It has got certain virulence factors like endotoxin, exotoxin, and enzymes. It has got certain pigments like pyocyanin and pyoverdin. Don't worry, we'll be talking about these virulence factors and pigments in detail in pathogenesis section, so stay tuned for that. This is how Pseudomonas aeruginosa looks like under the microscope. It is pink colored, tell me why. Yep, because it's gram negative bacteria. And it's motile, tell me what's the reason? Correct, because it has got a flagella, this one. Habitate, hosts. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is found chiefly in soil and water, but is also found in humans. Approximately 10% of humans carry it in normal flora of the colon, and is also found on the skin in moist areas, and it can colonize the upper respiratory tract, in hospitalized patients. Transmission. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is transmitted via contact with fomites and ingesting it in contaminated food or water. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is primarily an opportunistic pathogen and it causes infections in hospitalized patients, those with extensive burns. Also in people who has lowered or destroyed skin defenses, and also in those with chronic respiratory diseases like cystic fibrosis, and in immunosuppressed patients, and in individuals whose normal clearance mechanisms are impaired, and in patients with indwelling catheters. And Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the most common cause of ventilator-associated pneumonia. We can also call it nosocomial pneumonia. Nosocomial means hospital accord. Pathogenesis is based on pigments and multiple virulence factors. Let's talk about the pigments first. Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces two pigments useful in clinical and lab diagnosis. First one is pyocyanin, which can color the pus in a wound 
below. It damages the cilia and mucosal cells of the respiratory tract. The second pigment in the list is pyoverdin, fluorescence. It's a yellow-green pigment that fluoresces under ultraviolet light, a property that can be used in early detection of skin infection in burn patients. In the lab, these pigments diffuse into agar imparting a blue-green color that is useful in identification. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the only species of pseudomonads that is responsible for synthesizing the pigment pyocyanin. All right, now let's talk about the virulence factors. The first virulence factor in the list is its endotoxin. Its endotoxin is like that of other gram-negative bacteria and is responsible for causing the symptoms of sepsis and septic shock. The second virulence factor in the list is exotoxin. And the best known exotoxin is exotoxin A, which causes tissue necrosis. It inhibits eukaryotic protein synthesis by the same mechanism as diphtheria exotoxin, namely ADP ribosylation of elongation factor 2. The third virulence factor in the list is enzymes. Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces enzymes such as elastase and proteases. These are histotoxic and facilitate invasion of the organism, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, into the bloodstream. The next thing that is involved in the pathogenesis of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is type 3 secretion system. Strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that have a type 3 secretion system are significantly more virulent than those that do not. This secretion system transfers the exotoxin from the bacterium directly into the adjacent human cells, which allows the toxin to avoid neutralizing antibody. Type 3 secretion systems are mediated by transport pumps in the bacterial cell membrane. Of the four exoenzymes known to be transported by this secretion system, exo-S is the one most clearly associated with virulence. Exo-S has several modes of action, the most important of which is ADP ribosylation of RAS, R-A-S protein, leading to damage to the cytoskeleton. Now let's talk about the clinical findings. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can cause infections virtually anywhere in the body, but urinary tract infections and pneumonia are the common ones. It can also cause wound infections, primarily in burn patients. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an important cause of hospital acquired pneumonia because it's resistant to disinfectants, and especially in those undergoing mechanical ventilation. So then it will be termed as ventilator associated pneumonia. From these sites, the pseudomonas can enter blood, causing sepsis. The bacteria can spread to the skin, where they cause black necrotic lesions called ectima gangrenosum. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can also cause endocarditis in intravenous drug users. Severe external otitis, that is termed as malignant otitis externa, and other skin lesions, for example, folliculitis, occur in users of swimming pools and hot tubs, and then the hot tub one will be termed as hot tub folliculitis, and in that hot tub, chlorination is inadequate. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the most common cause of osteomyelitis of the foot in those who sustain puncture wounds through the soles of gym shoes. Corneal infections caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa are seen in contact lens users. And all of these diseases will have their own symptoms. Like urinary tract infections will have symptoms like discomfort in lower abdomen, burning and painful micturition. Pneumonia will have symptoms like fever, chest discomfort. Wound infections will have symptoms like pain in the area of the wound. And then the series goes on. Lab diagnosis. We'll need samples of urine, sputum, pus, blood, and tissue in order to diagnose infections caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Then we'll go for microscopy, and on gram staining, we found out that this bacterium is gram negative because it's pink colored. 
It is rod-shaped bacterium. It varies in size from 0.5 to 0.8 micrometers by 1.5 to 3 micrometers. It's pink colored. This is how Pseudomonas aeruginosa looks like under the microscope. It's pink colored. It's rod-shaped bacterium and is motile because it has got a flagella, which is not being shown in this image, but it actually has a flagella. Culture. Let's look at the colonies of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The pigments of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the pyocyanin and the pyoverdin, they impart blue-green color when they diffuse into agar. Pseudomonas aeruginosa grows as non-lactose fermenting colorless colonies on Meconikes or E and B agar. This uh, lowercase a and b represent the Meconikes and E and B agar, which is mentioned on the next slide. I'll show you in just a moment. The colonies of Pseudomonas aeruginosa are oxidase positive, a typical metallic sheen of the growth on TSI agar coupled with blue-green pigment on ordinary nutrient agar, and a fruity aroma are sufficient to make a presumptive diagnosis. Now, um, okay, now let's look at these four points. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is grown on EMB agar, Meconikes agar, TSI agar and ordinary nutrient agar. If you find D just like that, it means that this color will be shown on this agar. And in the recent slide, as you saw the A and B, which meant that that color appeared on EMB agar and Meconikes agar. This is how the culture of Pseudomonas aeruginosa looks like. The diagnosis of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is confirmed by biochemical reactions. The identification for epidemiologic purposes is done by bacteriophage or pyosin typing. So now you might be wondering, what's pyosin? Pyosin is a type of bacteriosin produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Different strains produce various pyosins, which can serve to distinguish the organisms. Now let's have a look at the treatment, but prior to that we should know how the treatment of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is done. Treatment is dependent on the resistance of Pseudomonas aeruginosa to antibiotics, the sensitivity of its isolates, and the frequent monitoring of the treatment. The treatment of choice is an anti-pseudomonal penicillin, for example, piperacillin, tazobactam, or ticarcillin or clavulinate. Plus, we can go for aminoglycoside, for example, gentamicin or amikacin. Ceftazidime is also effective. For highly resistant strains, colistin, the polymyxin A, is useful. The drug of choice for urinary tract infections would be ciprofloxacin. Prevention. Prevention of Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections involve keeping the neutrophil count above 500 per microliter. If the count of neutrophils is below 500 per microliter, that would mean the patient is immunosuppressed and Pseudomonas aeruginosa is now happy to cause infections in that patient. We can also go for removing the indwelling catheters cause indwelling catheters can also play a role in Pseudomonas infections. Lastly, we can go for taking special care of burned skin because burned skin is prone to Pseudomonas infections. And we can also go for similar measures to limit infections caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa in patients with reduced host defenses. All right, everybody, let's have a quick recap. The organism we discussed today is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It is responsible for causing diseases like sepsis, urinary tract infections, and pneumonia, especially the nosocomial pneumonia, chronic low respiratory tract infections, skin infections, external otitis, and endocarditis. Mode of transmission. It is transmitted to the hospitalized patients and in patients who have the destroyed skin defenses, to chronic respiratory disease patients, the immunosuppressed patients, or patients with indwelling catheters. Hosts include humans, soil, and water. Diagnosis is mainly based on gram staining, microscopy, and culture. Treatment involves antipseudomonal penicillin, aminoglycoside, ceftazidime, cholestin, ciprofloxacin. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comments. And if you want to connect with me on my social media, I've got my Instagram and Twitter, both with the handle Madzokhrov. And I'll see you in the next video. Till then, assalamu alaikum.